Okay, so we'll continue to our discussion of medical technology here. And I want to jump into thinking about uh, implantable medical devices. And, you know, I, I, the thing about healthcare in 2023 is it just continues to blow me away. Um, and so I hope it kind of blows you away too. But we've had implantable pacemakers, for example, for decades. Uh, and these are things that can be implanted in, in an individual's uh, chest. And the wires are placed directly into the heart to stimulate the heart for irregular heartbeats to, um, if the heart stops beating, it can bring it back, uh, can shock it back into, into proper functioning. I'm talking way outside my knowledge area here. Um, but it's just remarkable that, uh, that this technology can be surgically implanted into the heart and it can change a person, you know, it can keep a person alive. What's even more remarkable now though, is with current technology is this tech the once this is implanted it can talk to it can have a bluetooth link up to for example your cell phone uh, or to other computer devices so that the ongoing treatment of the heart can be monitored and it could download data either you know live streaming data for example to your doctor more more likely it'll be recorded and downloaded um, but then it can be reprogrammed without having to do surgery, right? A, a physician could come in and reprogram, you know, what the, what the device is doing to your heart. So that's an example of advances on something that we've seen for decades now. In a similar manner, if you have uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes and you have to regularly test yourself for insulin levels in your uh, – and um, or blood sugar levels, and then have insulin added. You know, imagine just being able to to tape this these sensors uh, onto your body along with a pump to that would automatically uh, inject insulin without having to think about it. I mean, a lot of the challenges that people with diabetes have is it requires discipline. So, and a lot of unmanaged diabetes, right? when you don't manage your diabetes, there are all sorts of things start to go wrong in your body. But managing diabetes is really, really unpleasant. It involves sticking yourself with a needle, testing the blood, then potentially, again, having to stick yourself and give yourself insulin. This takes all of the, all of the thinking and the discipline out of the hands of the individual and the machine just takes care of it without you having to do any thinking, other than you have to change out you know, the the attachments uh, periodically. Now, unpleasant, but maybe better than having to do all the processes manually, especially if you're someone who maybe doesn't have the mental capacity to do this on their own. Some other implantable devices that are, these are cutting edge, you know, science, they're, they're, almost science fiction, except that they're real and like they're actually being used. They aren't being used widely, but an, uh, some examples of medical devices that are working with the nervous system. So we have here an example of a man who had a severed spine and was able to walk again because he had implants in his spinal column to continue to communicate, to kind of jump over the gap in his, in his uh, uh, spine uh, so that he the devices could communicate to the nerves in his legs that he wanted to walk. It's pretty darn remarkable. And then this one, uh, wireless brain implant allows locked in woman to communicate. So here we we had a brain implant in a woman who was suffering from locked in syndrome, which is you're alive, you're aware, but you can't move any any of your uh, body voluntarily. So they surgically implanted a, a uh, an implant that allowed her with her thoughts to communicate by selecting letters, you know, painfully slow to process to do it. But isn't that so much better than imagine just laying in your bed and being unable to communicate in any way at all? Uh, that, that would be 
that would be a terrible fate. Um, and so this offers some relief to people like that. Now, this is my understanding is these tend not to last uh, very long, but if I were in that condition, I think I would take that chance. And here, of course, we have Elon Musk, who is a little nutty, uh, depending on how you perceive him, a little crazy, a bit of a performer, but he is without a doubt taking big swings at big technological advances. And so one of the projects he has is this thing called Neural Link. Uh, and what he's trying to do is with an implant in the brain, allow people to control devices, motor devices outside of the body. So moving devices, not motor, you know, motorized devices. So like a, like a, if you were a locked in person, for example, if you had this neural link, you could potentially control a robotic arm to, for example, give you a, a drink of water. That would be really remarkable, but, you know, taking it beyond the range of disability, this begins to get into transhumanism and, you know, imagine if you could drive, you could have one of these neural link chips and you could get into your Tesla and without using your hands, you could control your car. That's kind of the long run goal, but the short run goal is to help people with severe neurological issues such as, you know, severed spine that we were looking at a minute ago or locked in syndrome. So implantable devices, but then we have, you know, classic medical devices, prosthetics, right? So these are, uh, you know, replacements for limbs. So we have here a couple of examples of limbs, uh, some uh, couple of them that are kind of really interesting. S prosthetics are becoming more and more complex and motorized and, and more and more remarkable. And, I have you guys watching this week uh, a TED Talk by a guy named Scott Summit, who's a designer, and he was working with um, with uh, uh, prosthetic producers to make what he calls beautiful limbs. And so you'll see a whole uh, presentation that he does on making prosthetics that you know are prosthetic, but are also works of art. And it's a, uh, you know, kind of a pretty remarkable thing to give somebody their confidence back. So I, I hope you enjoy that video. Other medical devices. So we've had devices that are implanted, right? devices that um, are attachable to our bodies. Um, and now we have devices that we use that don't have any direct impact on us, but are used, um, uh, can be used for diagnostic purposes. And so Many of you have probably done 23andMe or Ancestry.com or something like that. Well, when 23andMe first came out, it wasn't clear whether the FDA would regulate 23andMe or not. And so they kind of came out and started doing stuff and kind of waited for the FDA to make a decision. And here's the remarkable thing. 23andMe can get your genetic data from just a swab of the inside of your cheek and with that data, not only can it tell you like, you know, what percent French are you and what percent, you know, Italian or Swiss or whatever, but it can also, it, this DNA data can also be used to get medical information such as, do you have a gene for Parkinson's? Do you have a gene for breast cancer and so on? And they can, they can identify whether you have a gene for these things, and they can identify the probabilities that you may develop a particular disease. And so early on, so there was some question and the F, uh, about whether individuals should be able to have access to this information through uh, a, a, a home test like this. And some people believe, and I had a colleague and I had an argument about this. He believed that I said, you know, so this information, the FDA eventually said, you can provide them, you know, the fun information, like you know, what percent French are you and whether you like, you're genetically likely to like croissants, but we're not going to allow you to tell individuals whether they are likely to develop Parkinson's or not, even though the company knows that information. Um, and so I had this argument with my friend about that, a uh, colleague about that. Um, and I was like, my position is, you know, you're, if you're a, an adult over the age of 18, and this is a, you know, this, this test 
has no chance of causing you physical harm. Right, the, the process of swabbing the inside of your cheek. I, 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 I struggle to come up with a scenario where you would somehow harm yourself in the process of having this test. Whereas, for example, if you are getting an X-ray, somebody, you know, you could be harmed by the X-ray. That's a that's a dangerous uh, machine. This is not any form of danger to the client, except for what the client might do with the information once they have it. And that was my colleague's argument is, well, some person might get a test back and says, hey, you've got a 80% chance of developing breast cancer. And then that person might then go commit suicide was his argument, right? And my argument is, back to that is, as an adult, if you make a decision like that based on um, based on this information, then uh, you know that's we can't we can't regulate people into good sense. The right thing to do, of course, would be uh, if you got a result like that, would be to then go consult your doctor. Um, you can get that sort of information if you pay a genetics uh, a geneticist to review it with you. So you have to pay a genetics counselor. So this is one of those situations where government is stepping in and saying, no, you can't have this information because we don't trust you with it. We don't trust you to not hurt yourself if you get some bad information back or to make some bad decisions based on the information that you get back instead of getting more full information. So this is kind of, you know, it depends on your perspective on what people's agency in life should be. I think 23andMe ought to be able to sell the whole package of information to you because the actual device itself, as long as uh, uh, as long as it has no possibility of doing harm. And then I think we could go with the efficacy piece of as long as the information they're providing you is accurate, then it should be it should be up to the individual to decide whether they want the information or not. But that's a source of contention. And right now it's been ruled that individuals can't have it even if they want it. Other medical devices, so chances are many of you probably have an Apple Watch. You know, Apple Watches are non-invasive. You're just wearing it, putting it on. There's no way an Apple Watch can harm you um, as it sits, right? So unless it was some sort of James Bond version where, you know, like it has an explosive in it, which they don't, right? So literally an Apple Watch can't hurt you unless somebody throws it at you. <clears throat> but simply wearing it and using it as directed, there's no chance of harm. And yet Apple Watches today can provide cardio, uh, cardiological in, in, information, information about your heart that is as accurate as you used to be able to get by going to a doctor's office and having a bunch of wires hooked up to your chest. So, and that's just the beginning, right? So the Apple Watch is an early stage of, aware, of, of wearable technology. We're just going to see this stuff getting more and more technologically advanced and more and more accurate and having more and better information. And so it goes back to the problem of the 23andMe, like do we let individual customers know their heart health or should we say, we don't trust you to have your heart health, you know, to have access to this information. And therefore um, we're going to prevent Apple from letting you have it. And, and then you know, right now there's no actual regulation. Here's, here's the other thing. Like Apple could tell you, hey, you're getting accurate heart health information. It's not currently being regulated as a medical device by the FDA, at least as of May, whatever it is uh, uh, that I'm, uh, you know, of 2023. As far as I know, the, health, the FDA is not regulating these particular devices as medical devices, but should they? Given the level of accuracy, given the fact that this data could eventually be used for medical decisions, should it be regulated as a medical device? I, I could see making an argument that if the heart health component is active and is and is being marketed as providing you information that has clinical value, that it should be regulated for efficacy like is the claim that apple is making accurate so getting from devices to pharmaceuticals we'll cover pharmaceuticals and it so pharmaceuticals so you we've all just been through covid-19 and you know you should be stunned as i am by the amazing 
uh, mRNA vaccines that came out. Now, this is mRNA is a whole new ball game. And it had been, we've been, we, not me, but, you know, industry has been developing mRNA technology uh, for a couple of decades now. Um, but the COVID-19 vaccine was the first mass application of the mRNA uh, capabilities. And, um, and, and this is just the, 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 the tip of the iceberg of the promise of what could potentially be a whole new class of, of therapeutic drugs, vaccines being just the start. Now, now uh, Moderna, um, as I understand it, Moderna ha got the DNA uh, or, 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 or the DNA information about the COVID-19 uh, virus and within a weekend had a proposed vaccine in place. Like most vaccines take 10 to 20 years to develop. The fact that we were able to develop a vaccine using this new technology, this new mRNA technology in a matter of, of days as opposed to years is just stunning. Just the possibility there is stunning. And the fact that we had a vaccine rolled out within a year is is just stunning. Normally, it's a 10 to 20 year development period. But because of this new technology, this new mRNA technology, which I will completely be honest, I don't understand. Uh, but this, this new technology enables this customization um, uh, uh, in such a way that that it is far more uh, uh, faster and efficacious and vaccines are really just the start you can imagine we could i can imagine at least uh things like cancer treatments being made because the thing about cancer is every cancer is unique it's an error a cancer is the result of an error in cell repl replication so cancers lung cancer one lung cancer looks a little bit like a different lung cancer and they are somewhat, you know, so person A and person B have both have lung cancer, but they're going to be different because the error that caused the cancer to come about is going to be virtually by definition different from person to person. So the opportunity with mRNA is to make a customized um, uh, treatment for each uh, individual cancer. And that would be just a stunning breakthrough. Um you know, that is maybe decades away. Who knows? Uh, maybe um, I'm hoping it's in my lifetime. And, and you know, if you're a young person, I, I'm going to guess within your lifetime, we will have a cure for cancer. But, you know, we've been saying that for a while. Let's hope so. Um, pharmaceuticals have allowed, have, have, have treated conditions that historically had been considered death sentences, right? So HIV, when I was in college in the late 80s, HIV was running rampant around the globe, killing millions of people. And today, HIV is basically a chronic disease. If you get HIV now, you are more likely to die from something else than from HIV. Uh, because we have now developed therapies that can treat it. So we've gone from a death sentence to a chronic condition. And, you know, maybe a mRNA will, will be the answer to actually curing HIV and maybe even having a vaccine from HIV. Let's hope. Um, other examples include things like hepatitis C. So hepatitis C, like HIV, is a bloodborne pathogen. So you get it from having unprotected sex of a particular, uh, typically anal sex, unprotected anal sex, because that creates a, a blood pathway, or from from sharing needles. So so it is mostly um, homosexual men and introvert intravenous drug users are most at risk for hepatitis C. And hepatitis C was historically a chronic disease um, that once you got it, you never got rid of it. Um, until just recently, there was a a, a drug treatment now that will completely cure a person of hepatitis C. But the cost, and it's called Harvoni, and the cost, uh, at least recently, was $94,500. Now, who is most likely in our society to have hep C? Well, who are most likely to be? It's uh, intravenous drug users. Well, it's a lot of poor people 
Um, and this is particularly so uh, this is particularly prevalent. Hep C is particularly prevalent in imprisoned populations. So this creates one of these these incredibly difficult ethical situations. We have people who are who we have imprisoned because they've done something antisocial. Maybe they're uh, murderers, uh, rapists, drug dealers, so forth. So they've done something that we've decided they need to be in prison for and away from society. And they have a high likelihood of developing hep C. So do we spend $95,000 on treating hep C in a person who we have imprisoned because of their behaviors? Or do we take that $95,000, for example, and fund some so, some other Medicaid beneficiaries? So children uh, from poor families and making sure that they get um, uh, vaccines, for example. So we have, this is a situation again, where we have to make these hard calls because there's limited resources, right? There's limited money that we have available to pay for social welfare benefits. And so one of the things we do, we do know how to do with hep C is we can manage hep C, right? You can live with hep C. You can live a whole life with hep C and it's very cheap to manage hep C as a chronic condition, or we can spend $95,000 and cure you of hep C. But if you're, a, you know, if you're a person who's in prison, and you are an intravenous drug user, and you haven't changed your ways, we could treat you with hep C, excuse me, treat you with Harvoni, cure you of your hep C, and then you could have hep C again within a year uh, because you haven't changed your ways. And so we come back to this hard, these hard ethical questions about cost and benefit um, and whether, you know, should we spend the limited resources we have on paying to cure, for example, a convicted felon of hep C, or should we manage their condition uh, and use that resource on a different population? So maybe prenatal care for pregnant mothers from underserved communities. Tough, tough calls. And that's why we have um, medical ethicists. All right. So why are so one of the things that probably everybody knows uh, in the United States is pharmaceuticals are wicked expensive, right? Um, and I will tell you that the reason, a, a reason that they are so expensive is development costs. So JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, uh, did a study, a recent study that identified that bringing a new drug to market was estimated at nine hundred eighty-five million dollars. Right. So that's the cost of you have to remember that drug companies will start a hundred different, you know, it will be like, hey, we have a hundred different ideas for a drug. And they'll start pouring money into doing those tests to see if they actually work. And then if they if they are safe and if they are efficacious, right? Safety and efficacy. So they'll start testing all those things. And that gradually that pipeline narrows down from a hundred to fifty to twenty to ten. And then finally, maybe, you know, maybe one finally makes it through. In that process, that drug company will have likely spent almost a billion dollars trying to get that one successful drug to market. And part of the cost is the cost of convincing the FDA that it is safe and that it is efficacious. Now, another reason why development cost, excuse me, why pharmaceuticals in the country are so expensive is patents, right? So, if I come up with a formula for a new drug, I apply to the US patent office and I get a patent, which then means no one else can make this thing that I have gotten a patent on for 20 years. So in other words, I have a monopoly. I'm the only person that can make this by law. And if anybody else tries to make it, I can sue them for patent violation. So that basically, if I come up with, so for example, Harvoni, right, the cure for hep C, if I come up with that, uh, I have 20 years where I can sell that that drug at any price I want and nobody else can compete with me because I have a monopoly, right? A legal monopoly, a government granted monopoly. Now, as soon as 20 years is over, that patent expires and generic companies can can uh, uh, can backwards engineer, like take my drug and then kind of reverse engineer it. That's what I was looking for, reverse engineer 
the drug and then make a generic drug and sell it, you know, instead of selling it for $95,000, they can sell it for $95. And suddenly everybody can have access to Harvoni or, or, you know, a generic equivalent of Harvoni. And wouldn't society be better off for that? So that's a, an example in, in some sense of a market failure, right? The fact that Harvoni costs 98, excuse me, costs $95,000 per treatment is a market failure. We want to be able to treat everybody who has hep C and, you know, by God, if somebody has hep C and they're, an, you know, and they continue to be a drug addict and they get hep C again next year, I want to be able to treat them again. So clearly what we have here is a situation where we have a market failure. So how would we fix that? Well, we could take the, take the patent away from the drug manufacturer, right? So whoever made Harvoni, I think it's a company called Gilead, if I remember correctly, we could take their their patent away and we could just turn it a generic immediately. Well, what would happen then? Well, the companies wouldn't be able to make back the $985 million that they spent on developing Harvoni to begin with. And so if you do that once, what happens? Well, the pharmaceutical companies are like, I'm not making another drug. I'm not investing another billion dollars for you to turn around and, and stop allowing me to make back the money that I invested. So we have a, a a problem. There are a lot of people who would like to just take patents away from drug companies. But if you do that, the drug companies will go out of business and do something else. So there isn't a simple solution. Now, generics, right? So the FDA classifies a generic if, if compared to the brand name version, it contains the same active key ingredient, um, has, a, has the same strength and the same dosage. So basically it's from, from our perspective, it is the same drug. Maybe it has a different color uh, or a slightly different shape or, you know, uh, or whatever, uh, but it's the same. So like, for example, I buy generic ibuprofen. Well, there is a brand name version of that called Motrin. I never buy the brand name Motrin. I always buy just generic like Hannaford, you know, that's our local grocery store, Hannaford brand uh, ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is the is the name of the active ingredient uh, that gives me the gives us the effect of Motrin. So when company when drugs go off patent, generic manufacturers step in and make and 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 engineer drugs that are identical, essentially identical to the brand version and then they sell them at a at a fraction of the price this competition reduces prices after the patent period is over there are some challenges with that so i've got you watching this this other ted talk um a dose of reality about generic drugs um uh, uh by Catherine eben eben uh and she has an excellent book called bottle of lies which i recommend uh and it is about the foreign generic manufacturers and 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 the fact that many of those drugs are getting into the United States. So you might your bottle of ibuprofen you're buying might have been made in India or China and then shipped into the United States. And the FDA has limited ability to regulate. If you're a drug manufacturer in the United States, the FDA has the ability to show up in your facility at any time to check on your processes. If you are a drug manufacturer in India or China, the FDA doesn't have any authority in India or China. The Chinese and Indian government have to give the FDA permission to come in and do inspections. And as you might imagine, the Chinese and Indian governments aren't necessarily all that interested in having the FDA interfere with the economic productivity of companies in their country. So it creates some real potential risks. Um, that we are not subject to in the United States by buying imported drugs. And it's hard to tell if you're buying an imported drug. So very good book, uh, Bottle of Lies. You should definitely check it out. Uh, so last piece, information technology. Healthcare, if you think about it, is essentially information-based, right? So medicine, the medical side of healthcare, as opposed to surgical side, is all about information. But even surgery, you know, is is information based, 
Where am I, you know, why am I cutting into this person's body? Where am I cutting? What are my goals? All of that is information-based, right? So inform information technology, information and information technology, the the transmission and storage of information is has always been and always will be essential to the healthcare system. So informatics is the science of how to use data, information, and knowledge to improve human health and delivery of healthcare services. Some of the things we're seeing today that are really exciting are electronic health records, um, predictive analytics, uh, communications, and so I'm going to talk to each of these. So electronic health records. When I first came into the business in the 90s, all health records were paper and pencil. So your doctor would have a, a folder. They would see you. They would make notes. They would handwrite notes into the folder. Um and then the folder would go back in their drawer or in their file cabinet, and you would leave. You would leave, and the the folder would go back into their, their into their file cabinet. If you were going to see a specialist, hopefully they would forward notes to the specialist. Um, but to, you know, but there's very limited. What happens if you go to the emergent? You have you're having a you're having a heart attack, for example, and you wind up in the emergency department. The, the emergency room doctor has no access to your medical record in order to make sure that you get better quality treatment. Today, electronic health records are taking care of all that. So if you're part of a, a, a healthcare systems, like if you're, if you're in the Boston area, you're part of the Mass General Brigham system, MGB, uh, they all use the same health record, electronic health record across all of their across all of their clinics and hospitals. So if you're being followed by a MGB doctor, a primary MGB to primary care doctor, and he or she is making notes in the electronic health record in, in his or her office, and you wind up having a heart attack somewhere else and you get treated in that, in an MGB facility, they'll just pull up your name and then they'll have access to all of your health information, which is a remarkably advantageous thing for a physician, uh, for an ED doctor to have. Also, all the specialists would have access to your entire health record. And what's also great about this is it's longitudinal. So, so meaning it, it gathers all this data over time. So all of the providers can see the same record and they can make the same decisions based on the same information. And then EHRs can do things like be programmed to prompt a provider to be like, hey, you need to call in Bonica to get his you know annual physical done. EHRs are now also allowing a thing called predictive analytics. And what this is, is, is really focused on population health. So when we have these large, these large data sets, so MGB has, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of patients, but it has all this data about all these different patients. What we can now do is use machine learning, artificial intelligence, to start sifting through all this data to look for patterns to be able to start to predict, hey, people that have these particular markers in their, you know, whether it's genetic stuff, whether it is, you know, patterns of, of care, um, test results, right? Machine learning can crunch through all this information and begin to make projections like, hey, people that have these conditions are more likely to develop type 2 diabetes. So let's try to get treatment to them before they develop type 2 diabetes. Or these types of people are likely to develop a particular kind of heart disease or, or have a stroke. And what we can do is predict in advance, and then we can start to treat before they start to get sick. So that's a really amazing thing. So I started to talk about machine learning and AI. Computers are already being trained to, computers are incredibly good at recognizing patterns. And a lot of medicine is really about recognizing patterns. In particular, fields like radiology, where a radiologist might look at a thousand images in a day. They sit in a dark room looking at screens and images and they're like, yep, normal, 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 normal. Mm -hmm. And they you know they're sitting there looking for the one thing that doesn't look like the other, look like the others right uh, uh, so the problem is human beings get tired they get cranky they break up with their girlfriend or boyfriend um they're hungry and maybe they or maybe they're just having a bad day and they might miss you know you're the one um 
interesting patient, as I like to say, right? You're the one interesting patient, the one with the anomaly. And if that radiologist is distracted right at that moment, they might miss your scan. They might miss the indication on your scan. Well, here's the thing. Machines don't ever get tired, right? Uh, computers don't get tired. So if we program a computer to look for a particular anomaly, they will find the anomaly. Now, um, we talked about complements. So ideally, and using the example of radiologist, ideally what we would have is a radiologist paired with an AI. And the AI might do the initial screening and then would bump out to the radiologist. Hey, here's all the weird ones that I'm not sure that I'm seeing. There's something different here and I don't know what it is, or there's something different here. And I think it might be, you know, think is a little too strong a word for an AI, but it, it this anomaly is associated with these conditions. And then the radiologist steps in and looks at just the weird ones, right? So that would be a really effective mechanism. And I'm, I'm not sure where that's at yet, but I, I know that is, is in the process of being implemented today, right? That's already in place today. Um, I was talking to a, uh, talking to a uh, healthcare, a hospital executive at one of our community hospitals, and they had just gotten a CT scanner, which is used to to look in particular at people's brains when they're have pot potentially having a stroke. And this CT scanner that they purchased had an AI built into it, such that if it detected as it was working and doing the scan, if signs of stroke were happening, it automatically called in a team to address the stroke. It didn't wait for the radiologist to look at the scan. The AI automatically triggered the, the stroke team to come in and, and, and start treating the patient, which is pretty amazing. And again, communications, uh, are, are we're going through an incredible communications revolution. We all just lived through, you know, a couple of years of being on zoom or, or teams or whatever. Um, but, you know, telehealth and telemedicine have been with us for a long time, but a, a adoption has been slow uh, for a number of reasons. But for many, but let me, and I'll get to those in a second, but for many conditions, especially things like psychiatry, for example, or psychology, telemedicine works really well. Um So telehealth, telemedicine is particularly valuable for things like, say, psychiatry. So imagine you are you uh, live in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, which is which is a town in New Hampshire on the uh, Canadian border. And you have a kid who has a psychiatric condition such as depression or anxiety. And you need access to a child psychiatrist. Well, there probably aren't any child psychiatrists in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, but there are maybe there's one that's down here in Durham. Well, that would be like a four hour drive to get to uh, four or five hour drive, I think, to get from Pittsburgh, New Hampshire down to Durham, New Hampshire, uh, all in the same state, but a good long distance away. Imagine you had to now do that you in order you'd have to drive down to get the initial evaluation and maybe you have to go back every month to get a follow-up visit with the provider. That'd be really onerous. But with telehealth, what we could do is set up a telehealth visit. You could do it from your house uh, with the with the provider who's down here in Durham and you'd never have to leave your house, never have to uh, never have to make that drive. Or even if you're in the same town, now you don't have to drive to the doctor's office. You can do it from wherever you are. So maybe you have a psychiatric condition and you need psychiatric care. Instead of leaving your office, you just shut the door. You go to a conference room, shut the door, log on to your phone, uh, have your consult with your physician, and you just go right back to work. So you miss you know, 45 minutes of work instead of time to taking time off to, to, to drive to your doctor's office, wait in the doctor's office, get seen and then drive back. Right. So you're cutting that lost 
productivity down. And this applies to primary care too. Like a lot of primary care can be done virtually. Uh, I've had a number of virtual visits over the last couple of years. Uh, I have a, a, I'm followed by my gastroenterologist for uh, GERD. It's a, it's a problem I have um, or I basically get heartburn. So, uh, and I have never seen her in person for that condition. I've only talked to her over the phone. Now she, that's a little bit of a lie. She did an endoscopy where she stuck a tube down my throat that you can't do um, uh, through telemedicine, but except for that, we have only ever talked over, uh, uh, over telehealth. And she's only a, a, a town over for me, but I appreciate the convenience of being able to have the visit from the comfort of my own home or my own office and not have to deal with the commute in, waiting in her office and all that. So like when I'm waiting, I just sit by my computer and read a book or whatever, but I'm, you know, I'm not wasting time. So that's fantastic. Now, here's the point I made about being all in New Hampshire. Uh, so, you know, New Hampshire is not the biggest state uh, in, uh, with the longest potential drives, but it is, you know, it, it potentially could be a couple of hours, especially if you live up in what we call the North Country or the Great Northern Woods, which is the northern portion of New Hampshire that's very, very rural. You know, you may not have to drive four hours, but you might have to drive easily. You might have to drive an hour and that would eliminate that commute. Now, what's more convenient if you're living up if you're living up in the tip of, of New Hampshire is either going to a provider in Vermont or Maine, because New Hampshire, if you look at a, if you look at our geography, New Hampshire gets very narrow at the top of the state. Um, and a lot of the providers, a lot of the better providers in Vermont are actually up near the top of the state. <clears throat> but unless a physician has a license for the state where the patient is, they can't do telehealth. So for example, if I'm living in Durham, New Hampshire, and I want a telemedicine or telehealth visit with a provider, that person has to have a New Hampshire license in order to provide any sort of communication uh, care to me, uh, even though it's over telehealth. So I could have a provider who's in Maine, in Kittery, Maine, which is about 20 minutes drive from my house. That person could not provide me care. Now, if I got in my car and I drove over the bridge, uh, over the Piscataqua and got into Kittery, then that provider could see me. But that provider couldn't see me through telehealth, even though she, he or she is only 20 minutes away. And even though I could easily drive to her, uh, uh, they couldn't do it over telehealth because they'd be doing it across state lines. So this is a what we call, on the one hand, it eliminates geographic telehealth eliminates geographic barriers like having to drive long distances, but yet this this regulation, the fact that we regulate medical pro, the provision of medical care at the state level, still creates uh, artificial geographic barriers. So it's a really amazing thing. Another, uh, so I have a note here, you know, direct patient to consumer, but also um, we can have, let me get the slide to flip. We can have uh, provider to provider, what's known as business to business. So for example, Dartmouth Hitchcock's telestroke program brings a neurologist to a rural ED. So Dartmouth Hitchcock is the largest teaching hospital in the in the state of New Hampshire has a lot of specialists there um, but you have small small hospitals that service rural communities that can't afford to for example have a neurologist on staff just because they they don't see enough patients to justify having the neurologist on staff. So when someone comes in with a possible stroke, that person has to see a neurologist. If a, if they come into the ED and the ED, ED, ED doc is thinking, this is a possible stroke, they have to have them seen by a neurologist. Um, the problem then becomes, if there's no neurologist on staff, the patient has to be life flighted, so put on a helicopter and flown to Dartmouth Hitchcock so that it can be seen that the patient can be seen by a neurologist at Dartmouth Hitchcock. Well, now we're in we're, we're in order to rule out stroke now, 
we're having to put somebody in a, hel in a life flight helicopter, fly them across the state, then get them seen there. And then eventually they have to get their way back to their home after they get treated. So a small, one of the critical access hospitals up in the North country, instead, what they're, what they're now doing, uh, there is a program with Dartmouth-Hitchcock that Dartmouth-Hitchcock sends, you know, this, this telemedicine technology. So in this image, you can see here, uh, basically we call it, we jokingly call it doc on a stick, uh, which is basically just, you know, it's a camera, it's a high quality camera and a screen so that the patient can see the doctor. Um, and the neurologist then runs the patient through a series of tests that, and, and that neurologist is assisted by the ED doc and or the ED nurses. And the neurologist is able to rule out stroke or, or, or say, yep, this person is having a stroke. You need to put her on a life flight right now so that we can provide her, you know, first of all, start this medication and then put her on a flight to us uh, so that we can we can treat the stroke. The good news is most of the time that we're doing rule out stroke, they don't the patient isn't having a stroke. And so the patient can stay uh, in their community and not get you know this crazy sh being shipped via helicopter across the state. So this allows more treatment to stay more local while still giving access, same level of quality, same level of, you know, better level of access and cheaper uh, to have it done all in the local community. So telehealth is one of the great ways that we are improving that triangle of cost, quality, and access. And then we have some other examples are teleradiology. I actually used teleradiology uh, on a B2B basis when I was the CFO of a small hospital in Louisiana. Uh, we were, uh, it was a military hospital in rural Louisiana. We had two radiologists on staff. And as a result, those two people had to co cover call 24 seven. So if somebody, you know, got in a car accident or a training accident came in and had to have, for example, uh, had a potential head injury and had to have a CT read, the radiologist, excuse me, the ED doc could order the CT but you had to have a radiologist read it. That meant one of our two radiologists had to get up in the middle of the night and come in to read it. Well, that's really hard year in, year out. And so we wound up contracting with a teleradiology firm in Texas that had the had licensed, had providers that were licensed to provide care in Louisiana. And they provided all of our night call. So they could do what we call a wet read, which is a, a kind of an initial evaluation of the scan. And that meant that our, our radiologists didn't have to uh, uh, come in in the middle of the night. So that was really great. And the cost was a fraction of hiring a third radiologist. I mean, a fraction, meaning like 5%. Okay. Um, so last slide. From a business side, information systems are making things work much, much better, and they are reducing cost, right? So if we can if we can schedule people better, for example, uh, that allows us to have fewer people, people are happier, um, and that saves cost. Lower cost allows us to spend more on quality and access. Uh, supply chain management, Another example, right? This allows us to streamline the ordering of supplies. We have less waste. Again, that reduces cost. We can schedule our operating rooms more efficiently. That increases access. Um, we can improve the coordination of services between providers. So I talked earlier about EHRs and communicating, you know, information between providers. That Im improves things. We have. Uh, EHRs also drive the revenue cycle. So this is the process of, of getting uh, payment for our organizations, which I know is, you know, kind of dirty thing to talk about, but you know what? Doctors really do need to be paid as do hospitals, right? They, they as, as kind and generous as we all want to be, we still have to pay the bills. So EHRs help drive the revenue cycle. Um, and then just just generally reduce waste in the system, and this is, and these business systems are important even in 
government run systems like the US military health system where I did most of my professional career or in the UK NHS. So that's an exciting overview of of medical technology and advances in medical technology. We'll come back next time and talk about something even more exciting, healthcare finance. <laughs>